Hi everybody, welcome to the latest episode of Flat Out. It's Northumberland Plate Weekend and Irish Derby Weekend over the course of the next few days. But of course, last week, it was all about Royal Ascot and a pretty tough week for punters, it has to be said. Some very big price winners and some big surprises as well. Plenty of horses I didn't think had group wins in them won. So uh, I think uh, it wasn't just me. Plenty found it very difficult. Um, but we're going to talk about Royal Ascot now, have a little bit of a reflection. Joey and Jack, of course, as ever, uh, in their hot seats. Um, chaps, it was a really tough week, very surprising one in many aspects. Um, Jack, start with you. What did you make of it generally and, and what did you take out of it? I, I really enjoyed the, the week, Tom, as a spectacle. Royal Ascot for me is always the best week. It's why I most look forward to and um, from a punting wise, it couldn't have gone much worse, to be honest. Uh, my my actual first winner of the week was Dawn Rising in the last race of the meeting. So <laughs> I was pleased to just get one on the board at that point. Oh, it was a desperate week for me. Ten seconds in all. I think about five or six thirds as well. Oh, just an absolute disaster. And yeah, the ones I really fancied as well, like Anti Post and uh, My Prospero and, and Jumbly, those couldn't even finish in the three on, on enhanced place terms. It was just a complete disaster. <laughs> it was really tough, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I had I had Docklands, I think, which got me out of trouble for the entire week. Uh, Haley Turner just getting up in time. I thought she might have timed it wrong, but just about got them on the near side. So that was that was a, a lucky one for me, at least. And um, Joe, what did, what did you think? It's some big shocks, isn't it? Some very big shocks. Uh, we we did warn. You know, <laughs> it's like it's <laughs> probably about the hardest place you can ever try and get a winner, isn't it? Um, so yeah, that was tricky. I. I kept it fairly, fairly subdued throughout. I thought it was tricky in the main. Uh, Ypiro was the one for me that obviously kept us on an even keel and made us get out of it in, and encouraged Bonami as well, which both me and you like, Tom, that kind of got us through the week okay. But my God, it was it was uh, full of uh, heavy punches taken left, right and centre, wasn't it, for everyone? So Especially Cardem. I mean... What's going on? I mean, Car he must have won up the old uh, Prince Charles or King Charles now. King Charles's little wagon track, mustn't he? I mean, that's something something like that we might talk about. The the ground was, I thought it was a bit funny. There were plenty of horses throughout the week that just bombed, just completely didn't yeah. run at all, didn't go at all on the ground, just bizarrely. Um, so, yeah, I thought there was some funky stuff going on. But, um, uh, yeah, some wild results, but some, some really, really top performances as well. I'm, not, I'm sure we're about to get into it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll 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 proffer forward first um, because I thought you just mentioned him, but Courage Mon Ami was was sensational to win the Gold Cup on on a fourth star is is nothing short of extraordinary. What a training performance! And the, and they earmarked the race a long time beforehand. We discussed on the previous podcast that John Gosden, you know, entered him after his second start that he'd won, and to do that in open company against older horses first time over a trip anything like two and a half miles was frankly quite something extraordinary and you know i think he is probably given his age as well he's going to be the star stayer for years to come i think you know unless something comes out of the woodwork admittedly it probably wasn't the strongest gold cup in the world and he's seen off coltrane who last year wouldn't have been you know in the mix against the likes of stradivarius but same time it's a really really good performance i thought um and the other two i just wanted to highlight were well, i already well, said docklands winning the britannia i thought it was a great performance uh he's obviously the the group horse in the handicap wasn't he um but it was a, a wonderful win. i nearly got beat <laughs> nearly got beat yeah yeah i mean sums up fair, the lead, doesn't it? <laughs> doesn't it yeah i mean yeah. finishing 10 lengths near side of, of, of the rest yeah. clear of the rest was, was something um and then the other one was Paddington, actually. I, I, I thought that was a really, really hot race on paper beforehand. Cicero's gift got no luck, but he wouldn't have been good enough anyway, I don't think. Um, but the way Paddington drew clear in the closing stages, for me, was a, a really taking effort. I think he'll be the one to beat in all the big mile contests throughout the rest of the year. So, um, yeah, I thought that was a... Because I thought it was a strong renewal. And um, he put them to sleep pretty easily, really. No, um, that makes total sense to me. Yeah. Just on the... Um... On what we were talking about with Docklands, for example, I think again it um, it kind of highlights again what when you're looking at those big handicaps, Ascot, you might as well just forget the draw. Like really, the only thing that makes most difference that you can actually have a real look at is the pace. And if you've got like, I mean, I thought that with Jimi Hendrix as well. You know, you really need 
that's the thing that makes the ultimate difference is if you can get dragged along by a group like I think it was one ease wasn't it in the blinkers first time that just went an absolute mm. ludicrous pace that just drags you into it and gets you further and allows you to kind of run a massive number whereas if you're just going a steady pace on the one side you haven't got the pace on your side you really don't get into it so um yeah it's they're, they're super tricky aren't they they're super tricky so but yeah um Docklands was impressive Jack over to you performances of the week well just to follow on from Docklands obviously delighted for Harry Eustace a, a second consecutive year that he's had a Royal Ascot winner it was brilliant uh, for him I wonder if obviously the the horse owned by OTI he could obviously end up in in Australia hopefully we we, we keep him on his shores but that's that race is usually formed by the foreign buyers um mm. they see that as a great trial to to go to Hong Kong and the likes so. of um, I'm sure like a new endeavor who was second there, he was unlucky. Um, he could be one that will possibly be going to foreign shores. But um, no, performance of the week for me, I'd probably say Brad Sale. I, I think it was a bold enough decision for them to to supplement for the Kingstown. It was it was a brilliant performance. Um, he, he he drifted a little left late on, but I think uh, for, for, for that type of performance for a three-year-old, it, it marks him out as a proper horse this year and the likes of the Nunthorpe and I think he'll actually be tailor-made for the Breeders' Cup sprint uh, at the back end of the year. He he just that's probably a type of race that Archie Watson would target as well. Um, but yeah, I thought that was a monster performance. Um, disappointment of the week, I, I could probably say that myself. But Wise Eagle, he just ran no sort of race. Um, Danny came back and he said he he was right hand ho- up the whole way and he just hung left um, throughout the whole race. He obviously lost a shoe as well, which wouldn't help. Um, he was a little sore and. To come back, he's fine now, which is good. Um, you'll probably have July off, and we'll probably think about maybe coming back in in August or, or possibly September. But the the main thing is he came back; he, he's fine. So um, he couldn't have run much worse, really, to be honest, without doing a proper injury. Um, but no, Danny looked after him in the straight. So um, no, there'll be better days ahead, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure there will be. And you know, he's a, he's a he's still a very exciting horse going forward, isn't he? Big. Big days to come for him, no doubt. Um, Joey, what were your performances of the week? Well, I mean, I, I just, I, I think, you know, not, not to bore everyone, I mean, sure, plenty of people have, have, have listened to a few of these already and they've gone over plenty of performances. Everyone has something different to say. Um, often, if someone's backed them, they pick up, they put the ones they backed, right? But in terms of the most jaw-dropping one, I, I thought Shaquille, in the Commonwealth yeah. was, was was just the most kind of like what is that performance? It's you know, crazy. It just surprised me. You know, like I mean, you couldn't do much more wrong mm. in terms of you know just richly rearing in the stalls. O'Sheen's just gone about it so sensibly to kind of just slowly get him in, going back up, make up that distance to the pack, and then he's latched on like a madman and has been tearing around all over the place, wanting to go faster, and. The pace has held up in the race against probably what one of the best two-year-olds we've seen last year in Little Big Bear, and he's run him down and gone by him and made it look easy at the line. I thought that was just savage stuff, you know, in terms of an amazing performance. Um, so yeah, I mean, he would be the one that would stand out to me as just like the the one that surprised me, and you know, I'd be really interested to see how it goes goes forward to the July Cup. Um, I thought Tahira was an odd one. I thought that was an odd one. Like, I mean, we were both discussing, weren't we, the trip that she should be mm. running over. I mean, the speed she's she changed, changed your view now, Joe, would you say? I wouldn't say she's changed my view. I, I, I just think she might just be exceptional, like, like superstar level, like to be able to do it. And wouldn't it be interesting if they dropped her back to a sprint trip at some point, like, and really saw what she could do? Because she can really, really turn her feet over fast for a little while, can't she? But she's got mm. the class to beat these these fillies anyway but um yeah I, I don't know we'll see what happens with her we'll see what happens but they, there's there's potential there but i i'm i, I heard what dermot wells thinking of stepping up in trip isn't he so you know um but yeah I, I thought that was one that that kind of presented some questions anyway um frankie frankie obviously frankie was the story throughout the week wasn't he and uh the frankie factors and I, I love when people get really excited about his rides i mean i, I thought the ride on gregory was just a classic frankie ride mm. just for me, a lot of the time, suboptimal. You know, he's not, he's, I, I think that horse yeah, has just yeah, won yeah. that race for him. Like, he's gone way too quick at times. He's obviously been drawn wide, so he's had to go gun him to the first bend to get him 
into a prominent position and then gone quick at stages of the race where he's gone a bit too quick and he's just relied on that horse to be better than the rest and i think it's i think it's really important that that's the thing about frankie is that often he will try and take variables out of things so ryan as like his obviously his great adversary in terms of being the, the other superstar jockey around in this in this neck of the woods tends to just give every horse the best ride he feels on the day whereas frankie will do these things like that where he'll just go do you know what I'm going to take all the variables out of it. I'm going to go too quick and trust that John's put me on the best horse here. And if that's the case, we'll win, even if I give him a slightly suboptimal ride, but I won't get in trouble over there. I thought, you know, the best ride, the better ride he gave was Courage Mon Ami. I thought I was really, really good the way he just sat there quietly and just pounced at the right time. So, yeah, those those are my highlights for the week of just or talking points of the week, shall we say. I think those three were the, the ones that interested me the most. Yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting, interesting um, conundrum, if you like, next year. Because if Gregory goes down the Gold Cup route, Wathnan Racing mm-hmm. are going to have probably the two favourites, aren't they? And the, and the two really unexposed Gold Cup contenders to, to look forward to. Mm-hmm. So that'll be very interesting. And particularly if Frankie retires, which is probably going to at the end of the year, um, I still have my slight doubts. But, um, you know, he's more than likely to. Then they're going to have to come up with two riders for each, for each one, one rider for each horse. So that'll be another intriguing um, little talking point. Maybe Rab will finally get his day. Yeah. No, I hope so. It'd be great. Um, no winner, of course, unfortunately, for our sponsors, Opulence Thoroughbreds. Um, but there'll be plenty more big days to come for them. And I'm sure this is only the start of their career at Royal Ascot and uh, having runners with big chances, which, of course, Leah Special did. Didn't fire, unfortunately, Joey. But um, this is only the start, I think. Certainly. And obviously, a bit of luck, a bit of bad luck with the two horses not quite sneaking in even though they were right close um so yeah i mean there will be there will be other days for those two um Le Special, as can happen in those races you can just get a bit lost in them can't you um will come but he'll he'll go into competitive races later in the season they have a, have a right chance i think so i wouldn't be too upset about it um yeah yeah 100 percent. and please do please do let us know in the comments uh what your uh, your your favorite moment was or the horse that you perhaps going to pick out of royal ascot going forward for the rest of the season that may may have won or may not have won uh perhaps been unlucky in defeats or didn't get a clear run or some such nature we would love to hear from you and do like and subscribe to our videos because it does help us out immensely uh that's royal ascot reviewed uh we got racing coming up this weekend though of course and we're going to go through some of our best bets for the couple of days, Saturday and Sunday, maybe even Friday as well. I know Jack likes something on Friday. Um, but the big race, I suppose, in England is the Northumberland Plate, Joey, and um, as always, looks pretty competitive. Yeah, it looks fiercely competitive. Uh, at this you know, this stage in the week, you've got a lot of horses that run at Royal Ascot, and you're not sure whether they're going to turn up. Um, you have all sorts, can't you? I mean, Trushan won it last year, didn't he? Skipping Royal Ascot off an absolute monster weight uh, and then you have horses you know in the 90s that can win it so yeah i mean it's a, a hugely competitive handicap but one in your one of your neck of the woods jack your local track so i mean do you have a fancy in the race this year i must admit i don't have a that much of a strong interest at the moment i'd probably wait for, for decks um yeah my neck of the woods though sacrilege to to rip up the turf course back well a few years ago now but yeah it's, it's just not the same for me now running on on the all weather, but um, no, I'm sure the the crowds will be packed out again, and it'll be a great day um, out in the northeast there. Yeah, yes. it certainly will. Yeah, 80, 81 thousand pounds to the winner, one hundred and fifty grand overall. So it's it's really quite the prize at the moment. Post impressionist for Tom Marco and William Haggis is the favourite. Joey, who do you fancy in it? I personally have a fairly strong fancy in the form of Adjuvant. Um, I think we we had form advertised well from Newmarket at Ascot with HMS President, who ran second last week, ran really, really well. I think this horse just is crying out, really, at this stage to go up to two miles. I think this is really going to help him go in the extra couple of furlongs. He's been shaping like it. Um, he, the horse he beat last time in Point Alias is Point Alias, Pons Alias. I never know how to say that. Tom, come on. Resident, resident pronunciation man. How 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 well, are we I, going? How are we going with this one? I I would always say Pons alias, but um, I wouldn't necessarily Pons be. Alias. Uh, I would have thought I would have gone silent s there, just Pon alias. The Pons, like it's Latin, so I think it is Pons. Is it Latin? Yeah. 
it is yeah. Pons alias. Yeah. Um, so it, he ran that horse, went and won, advertising the form really well at Goodwood. He's also in there as well. Um, but I think he beat him fairly decisively. Um, but yeah, he's gone and advertised the form really well since. He's gone up four pounds. I mean, back he, he ran really well in the Melrose, didn't he? I mean, give it trying to give Sulcombe five pounds. I mean, good luck with that assignment. Um, it, he's the sort of horse I just think has got a fair bit of improvement. If we're talking about negatives, it, it, you know, he's never run on the all weather before, but I, I shouldn't, I don't see it being a problem. I think he's primed to run really well. I'd probably have him favorite in here. You've got post impressionist as favorite, who obviously has a clear chance, beat him on the final start of last year and has. Any amount of upside, of course, but he's, he's just took him a while to get going last year. I'm not sure I want to be with him first time out this year. I mean, for all, you, you can't really take too strong opinion against some of these haggis horses in handicaps. You know, he's just savage at the moment with them. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm pretty willing to take him on with adjuvant first time out. I really quite fancy him to run well. At this stage, it'd be a win only bet. I'm not, I'm not one for back in each way at this stage um, you get better places on the day but i can see him going off going off shorter yeah it's a, it's a really good case you put forward actually i'm 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 gonna not take you on as such but i i find something at a bigger price so i think we'll run very well and possibly run to a place maybe even win uh, a horse that we all know very well has been around for yonks uh, rainbow dreamer for Ross Ryan Allen King actually finished second to Pons Alias in the Stayers series final at Kempton at the back end of last year. That was a good run. And I suppose in the kind of last year or so, calendar year, um, he started to rediscover some of that old form. And he's not getting any younger. We all know that. He's 10 years old now. But he beat Island Brave in a two-mile handicap at Kempton, then did that second behind Pons Alias, and then was second again behind Dark Scirocco. Didn't really run his race so much uh, behind Earl of Tyrone, who's a very good horse at Kempton after that. But then his star performance really came when winning at Newcastle, of course, uh, the Best UK All-Weather Marathon Championships Condition Stakes, as it is known in its full title. But the uh, yeah, that was All-Weather Finals uh, staying race. And he did it really nicely, I thought. And the advantage of that was it was at Newcastle over the course and distance that we're going to have on Saturday. Now, he's rated 100 in this race which leaves him pretty nicely treated on his old form. He was rated 111 recently as uh, the summer of 2021. So it's not actually that long ago. And given he likes a strong pace, likes to be held up off one, I think he can run into a place. He's been hit and miss in this race in the past, but I feel as though over the last six months or so, he's really started to find himself again. Um, so he'd be, he'd be a nice, confident each-way pick. I think he'll run above his price. He's always overpriced, I feel. And uh, at the moment, he's around about 25, 20 to 1. So um, he'll he'll do for me at a, an each-way price. <clears throat> I should also uh, say Billy, Billy Lucknan uh, up on Adjuvant. I mean, that's obviously a massive plus as well. And just going back to his um, the way he finished these races, um, the way he finished at Newmarket last time, he's firing 11 second furlongs, admittedly off a slow gallop. But he's a classy horse, Adjuvant, on his day. And I, you know, I think going up to two will really suit this horse. So... The extended staying trips i think we'll, we'll see some more improvement sorry tom i didn't mean to um right. you know jump off the back of yours there but i just wanted to well it le le leads me quite nice actually because you, you mentioned billy lock and on your horse and, and ross orion's on mine and it, he's actually riding at the top of his game had a really good royal ascot and since roamed plenty of winners as well so i'm delighted with ross being on mine um let's move on a bit then jack what, what's your your main fancy if you like for the weekend well come we might as well start on friday um I, I, a horse that I've mentioned on the, on the pod before, it's a horse called Tafrij. He was on the radar for the Britannia. He didn't win a Goodwood, so connected that probably kept him in shallower waters for now. But he runs at Yarmouth in the in the 330. Um, he actually won there as a two-year-old. Uh, he steps up to a mile here. And, yeah, I just think in terms of a best bet that, that he would be it. I think he's well ahead of his mark, coming back to a track he's won at, grounds in his favour, and then... Um, I struggle to see him getting beat. It's a, it's a smaller field here. And I just think everything's primed for him to strike here before moving on to, to bigger and better targets. Yeah, it's um, not every day that we we tip a horse at Yarmouth on this podcast on a Friday afternoon. But uh, yeah, it's good to hear it, Jack, and a, and a case well made as well. Um, Joey, anything else for the weekend that you, you, you're a fan of or, or maybe looking forward to seeing? Um, I'm... <sighs> Look, I mean, the main action, really, the weekend is in Ireland, isn't it? And um, I, I'm keeping an eye on Came From The Dark to see if he gets 
uh, declared in the Rockingham on Sunday. Um, I, I like these. I like these uh, English sprinters in these mm. Irish handicaps. I think they're well treated, and so there's a few of them in there that I'm keeping an eye on. Um, he would probably be the main one. I think. I don't think there'll be enough juice in the ground for Dakota Gold. Um, the likes of Alligator Alley, um, Michaela's Boy is another one. Just one of these. I'll be. I'll be looking to drill down once we know what the final field is. But one of those. I. I think the Curra might suit. Will suit. Uh, uh, came from the dark, so he might be the one that's probably top of the shortlist at the moment. But I'd be interested in looking at that race in particular, probably for a fairly stronger bet later in the week. And there's just a few just to keep in mind. Okay, nice. Yeah, Jumby in the Criterion. I think it'll be tough to win that seven furlong uh, group three, considering he's carrying a penalty. But that said, I think he is. If you watched that race last time, the one at Haydock, it was a really nice performance. And um, he basically didn't come off the bridle. I think William Buick is now on. I think he's the perfect rider for him. Just going to cajole and niggle away at him. And he travels supremely well over that seven furlong trip. He needs it rattling fast, which he's likely to get it. Hopefully, we won't have too much rain at all, if any. And. Um, yeah, he was he was bang on it last time. I thought it was a very, very good performance. And even under a penalty, I think he's worth watching um, in that uh, Criterion Stakes Route 3 on Saturday. And just keep an eye out, too, for a horse at Newcastle called Eagle's Way, who is coming back from a layoff for Sir Mark Prescott. He was last seen completing a four-timer, as so many of Sir Marks do. He's now up to a mark of 96. He goes in the Education Network handicap 350 over the extended mile two. He wouldn't be a bet at all, but I'll keep an eye on him because he could be the type to really improve and progress, as so many of Sir Marks do. And if he wins that off 96 off top weight, then he'll be certainly taking part in listed contests and above, you'd think, going forward. Um, so he'd be my other one to, to keep an eye on. Lovely stuff. Well, we can't leave without discussing the big group one on Sunday, which is the Irish Derby. And Auguste Rodin is going for the uh, the Derby clean sweep, isn't he? With uh, uh, that wonderful victory at Epsom, he'll be bidding to follow up. And it is a fairly good renewal. I think we're all in agreement about that because he's got to beat the likes of Spreewell and White Birch, who have both performed very creditably and did so at Epsom, alongside others who are coming into it who weren't actually in the derby itself. But the Irish derby is all about August Rodin as far as the market is concerned. Joey, what do you make of the race? And, and do you think he is a certainty? I don't think he's a certainty. Um, I think he's 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 obviously very, very likely to win. I just, looking at the derby in terms of, you know, as it, a horse I love in terms of Wipero, you've got King of Steel, you've got Artistic Star, who's run very well behind King of Steel, like showing that form again. I think it's a it's a it's a fairly decent race. I mean, you've got White Birch, as in who ran fantastically well. We've Prince Sprewell's probably a decent horse on the back of that. I think the form's gonna is looking quite solid. You know, you've got a horse like Sprewell who didn't handle the track. I think the Curra will definitely suit White Birch better, you know, be able to get into that big lolloping stride, you know, really get going. Um, from a long way out there but they're going to have to run to a monstrous level to beat this horse aren't they I mean outside of outside of Equinox this is probably the most exciting horse in training and uh, it's it's very hard I think to be too bullish against him because I, I I really I think that obviously if you're looking at it you're looking at five to one for Spreewell and White Birch and I just other than that up and under who you know White Birch has put away already I just I, I don't see much of an each way angle into it obviously um, so I, I think it's more of a, a watch and, and, you know, kind of enjoy if, um, August Redan turns up clearly the ground being good and probably a mile and a half is going to be his best trip and everything's, everything, everything looks pretty suited for him to run really, really well. So, you know, I watch away, but I just, I do think it's worth noting that, you know, those two in behind are not mugs. And so, you know, it should be quite a good spectacle. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I'm a huge Spreewell fan. I have to admit, I think he's going to get a lot closer to August Rudan at the Curra that he did at Epsom. As you say, he didn't handle the track, got on balance two furlongs from home. He didn't get a clear run either. Nothing went right for him. And he got very hot beforehand. He was notably sweaty before the race. Hopefully he won't have that problem at the Curra on Sunday, a much more even track. And I think he'll perform 
and hopefully show the, the turn of foot that he did in the trial leading up to the derby, which was an absolutely superb performance, beating up and under by three lengths. The ground was soft to heavy that day. I think he might be a touch better with a bit of give in the ground. That's not to say he didn't handle good to firm going when fourth in the derby, but I think he might just be a little bit more useful when there's a bit of give underfoot. That said, I think he's going to run a massive race. August Rudan sets a mighty standard. You know, he's going to have to, you know, on, on ratings, he's nine pounds behind. But I don't think that's the ceiling of his ability by any means, 113. I think on this more even track, more syncretic course, I think he'll run a much better race. I expect him to be second. And I'm hoping that he's going to push August Rudan all the way because I think he's got a lot of talent. He wasn't able to show it completely at Epsom. So hopefully that the real Spreewell can please stand up. Jack, what about you in the, in the race? I, I'm just going to keep it simple here. I think August Rudan wins and wins easily. I, I can certainly see Spreewell re reversing that form with White Birch. As you mentioned, he didn't get a clear run. I think there was no real excuses for White Birch. And I, I would probably say if there's any kind of bet out of behind August Rodan, it'd be really well for a filth each way. But no, I think August Rodan's a proper monster. And it, it was notable that Aiden always kept the, uh, the faith with him. Um, quicker ground. And I believe that Ryan had said that at not, no point in the race did he ever think he was going to get beat, which I think is quite something. And no, I expect him to just to win here, to be honest. Not really original. There's a bit. I think it was a bit harsh on old White Birch. I mean, he did kind of fall out of the stalls again. Was like playing the idiot as well. I mean, I, in terms of excuses, obviously you're fully with an excuse that's valid. You kind of you have to expect that it won't happen again. Which with him, mm -hmm. it absolutely will. But you can never say being round, being last, coming round the bend in the derby is some kind of advantage. You know, it, it, it's not. Well, that, that's just the way it's written, well. though, isn't it? I can certainly well, see not, your point. No, about but it's not. Well, but, it's not really the way it's it's the way they it, they're forced to ride him because of his behavior half the time but well, you know it's, it's I, no I, I think he's got well maybe maybe it would you never know maybe it well, would we will see it's, we? it's but that's in terms of excuses so you there you absolutely can make excuses for white birch whether you think they're valid or not i think is the question uh you know so but i i think the spree world certainly for for me has as more um, excuses that are valid you know he clearly didn't handle it to me um but it was the track i i, I if you look at his pedigree I, I i just don't get this i i think he will be better on i think the ground's absolutely fine for that horse not a problem acted on it fine for that really quick ground there it'll be good at the weekend he'll be just fine i don't think he'll have any excuses this time and we hopefully see big improvement from him and get a really decent race but Jack just yeah, raised I mean, White Birch. I, I just couldn't let that. I couldn't couldn't let that fly. Uh, yeah. Well, we all want we all want a good race, and at the end of the day is the main thing. Quick note as well: if you're used to watching the Irish Derby on a Saturday, this year it's not the Pretty Polly on the Saturday, and the Irish Derby is on Sunday. So make sure you don't get your Saturdays and your Sundays mixed up. Gents, thanks very much. A lot of fun as always. And um, yeah, I mean it's it's a difficult weekend, isn't it? This one always after Royal Ascot. It's quite quiet and. Um, we're trying to lick our wounds a little bit, aren't we? After after last week, we certainly are. Uh, just out of, of interest, why is why do you reckon there is such a, a bias in terms of Newcastle as wanting to be the near side rail? Is is it by any chance? I mean, having lived in Newcastle, the windiest place, probably one of the windier places in the country, is the wind coming off the North Sea from that direction or something that's hitting those runners? No, it's just a complete dead man's land. You do not ride up that far rail. Um, you want to be centre to to near side and yeah, high numbers and. Obviously, a pace will always play a part in that, but yeah, far side. I just, side on why. I just, I just no idea. Why. Yeah, I wonder if it's something to do with yeah. the, the the way the track is harrowed or the way it's laid out, and mm. maybe that the ground that they they race on, the the tap the surface they actually race on, is a little bit slower on that far side for whatever reason. I mean, it won't be an intentional thing they do, but I mean, yeah. maybe it's just one of those things that the track is built as such that that is something that unfortunately happens. It just seems so clearly pronounced that you're like you're looking at it going there must be some really clear reason for this as in some natural thing as in like rain coming from one direction wind something that just but yeah it's just it's very obvious when you're watching it but there's no real offered reason why out of interest gents what did you think of the ground at ascot obviously it was a, a topic with that uh channing picked up with on on luck on sunday do you have any problem with some of the watering that was done 
Yeah, I, I mean, I've always preferred just to, to the lake, let nature take its course. That that rain without watering on the Tuesday morning would have been ideal, really. There were, as I proved it, there was no need for that water. And like it's summer, we're, we're going to get rain probably in August onwards. So let, let us have these month or two. Um, I was looking at the times actually there. The Fugues 10 furlong record was a few seconds quicker than what Most had done. So we were, we were by no means rattling ground and it was absolutely scorching all week. So there was plenty of water put down, but that's, that is the way we're heading, I suppose, isn't it? I mean, exactly, I, I, yeah. Sorry, Tom. So I was going to say, I, mean, I, 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 I have to say, I don't know what all the fuss is about. I really don't. I thought it was an absolutely beautiful racing surface the entire week. I mean, if you're, if you're Chris Stickles, you've got one of the hardest jobs in the world. You're never going to please everyone. There's always going to be someone who doesn't like what you do, doesn't like the way the ground's been maybe you know you've had a bad week punting and you blame the ground for that but to be perfectly honest i i saw no issue with it i thought it was absolutely perfect the whole week and for me it was it was great to watch and i think if you're the, at the end of the day with these with these big meetings you want to have the ground that sees every single horse if it possibly can be best suited that makes sense so you want as many horses as possible to perform to the best they can and I think we pretty much have that at Ascot. I mean, you're never going to get that. You know, there's a few soft ground lovers like True Sham, but there aren't many on the flat. And the majority want conditions like we had last week. And to be honest, I think there was nothing to grumble about. I would, I would, I would echo that to some degree. I mean, you've also got you've got a big meeting like that on ITV. It's one of the ones they really, really push. And you have a fatality on the final day, which is obviously extremely upsetting for everyone involved. It's not what we want to see. It's, it, unfortunately, this you've got your breeding. We bred horses to a point where the watering happens now. So that if you're not producing these good racing surfaces, the, the average horse is not bred to run on that on, on the ground when it gets really, really fast anymore. So you have to, I just feel like you have to get the watering cans out now. You've got yourself into this situation. Whereas you'd have to literally stop racing for a little while or or change the way we've bred the horses. Because the majority of them just, you know, you've got a you've got a lot of that kind of northern dancer line in there now where they've just got long pastons and things and they're a little bit more delicate. And you can't be running on fast ground anymore. They can't be running down the M25. They've got to be running I, on something with a bit of juice in it. Yeah, I could totally agree with that, Joe, I have to say. I, I've got to say, a, a minor gripe of mine is that uh, Clark of the courses end up getting a huge amount of stick when a lot of the time they don't really deserve it. Every now and then they do. But I have to say, the, the, the most major example of this I can think of is a couple of years ago at Cheltenham Festival on the Wednesday when there was an unbelievable amount of rain that wasn't forecast. It was a little bit was maybe forecast. And in the end, they had an absolute deluge. And John Pullen had watered the course and he received absolute pelters from everyone. And I'm sure that he probably wanted to you know sink into the ground. And I remember trainer Paul Nichols was, was absolutely furious with him and <laughs> I mean I, I look I know that in the end the ground was I think heavy but the fact that it wasn't forecast what can you do like if you're you, this is the will of the gods and the will of the, it, the I mean, you, you're, they you're put too much on Tom that's the problem like maintain good to firm ground just the, the times were suggesting it was good to soft on on Tuesday and like on Tuesday yeah yeah, like there was just no need to put so much water on and it would have been fair enough by the end of racing, it would have been the quicker side of it. Then from then you maintain it. There was just it's just too much. It's too much at the moment. Fair enough. Well, we've fair all got enough. differing opinions on that. It's actually that, that could rage yeah. on and on. Um yeah. again, comment comment on that. If you've got an opinion about yeah. the ground, give us a comment. Let's get let's keep the discussion going because it's certainly yeah, hopefully the topic. uh Hopefully, Michael Prosser is going to have New Markets July course absolutely bang up for it in a couple of weeks. Oh, he, he loves the host pipe, doesn't he? Yeah, so <laughs> I'm sure that, that'll be getting watered to hell. Never seen a man take more pride in grass than Michael Prosser. Um, gents, lovely stuff. I think that concludes everything. Um, just to remind everyone, please gamble responsibly. Uh, gambling should be fun, of course, and when the fun stops, please do stop. And uh, once again, thank you to our sponsors, Opulence Thoroughbreds. And please do like and subscribe and comment below with whatever you fancy and a few talking points this week. So thanks very much for watching and we will see you next time.